How did American Airlines Flight 1420 go from this to this? If you want to understand what happened to Flight 1420, you have to begin not in Little Rock, Arkansas, where the plane ended up that night, but 500 kilometers away in Dallas, Texas. It was 10 past 8 in the evening, and Captain Richard Bushman and First Officer Michael Urgel had just landed in Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. They were 40 minutes behind schedule because of the weather. This was a stormy summer evening in the American Southwest, with heavy rain and high winds buffeting the airport. Bushman and Orgel had started their day in Chicago at 10 in the morning, and Flight 1420 from Dallas to Little Rock was their third and last flight of the day. Previous episodes in this series have explored the role that incompetent crews played in their respective accidents, but this flight crew is different. Captain Bushman, at 48 years old, was a highly accomplished pilot. He had served in the US Air Force for seven years, where he attained the rank of Lieutenant Colonel before joining American Airlines in 1979. Bushman had a spotless training record with American Airlines and had built up over 10,000 flying hours by the time of the accident. The year before the accident, he'd been promoted to check airman on the MD-80, meaning that he trained new pilots on the aircraft and gave them their license to fly it. Six months before the accident, he'd been further promoted to chief pilot at American Airlines Chicago base. According to interviews with the base manager, he had been selected for this position due to his flying background, company achievements and leadership skills. This base manager had said that he was, quote, extremely comfortable flying with the captain and that the captain had a great deal of common sense. The first officer who had flown with the captain on the day of the accident said that he was, quote, a knowledgeable pilot who was not intimidating. First officer Argel was also an above average pilot. He was 35 years old and had just been hired by American Airlines in January of that year. Before this, he'd been a corporate pilot for six years, flying the Learjet on other aircraft. He had also been the director of operations and the chief pilot for an air charter company and was a flight instructor as well. Like the captain, his career began in the military, in his case, the US Navy, which is where he had completed his primary flight training. A captain who had flown with the first officer the month before the crash had described him as, quote, an above average new hire who was very competent and knowledgeable. It's important to keep the pilot's experience in mind as over the next few minutes we'll see them make a series of increasingly grave mistakes which will end up killing a number of people on board. But for now, back to Dallas. The pilots made their way to the departure gate for flight 1420. The flight was already delayed by 30 minutes at that point, with a new estimated departure time of 9pm. This time came and went, and the first officer warned American Airlines dispatch that they would need to depart by a quarter past 11 at the latest or they would be exceeding their maximum allowed duty time of 14 hours. He then telephoned the dispatcher and suggested that he either get another aircraft for the flight or cancel it. Sometime after this, the dispatcher found a plane to substitute in for the original one, and the six crew and 139 passengers started boarding. The aircraft being used for this flight was a 17-year-old McDonnell Douglas MD-82. American Airlines had a vast fleet of about 300 of these aircraft at the time, and was the world's largest operator of the MD-82. In fact, at one point, they made up literally half of the airline's fleet, and one-third of the MD-80s ever produced. American used the MD-82 mainly on domestic routes, as it was cheap to operate as well as being safe and reliable. The pilots were eager to get to Little Rock. They had been working for more than 12 hours, and they were under pressure from the airline to get to their final destination of the day. To make matters worse, the weather was deteriorating, and the route to Little Rock was flanked by thunderstorms. This was not going to be an easy end to their day. Flight 1420 eventually departed Dallas over two hours behind schedule. At about 5 minutes to 11, as the aircraft was en route, the flight dispatcher sent the crew a message suggesting that they hurry up as much as possible in order to beat the thunderstorms which were now closing in on Little Rock. The crew were no doubt feeling the pressure, but the atmosphere in the cockpit was still calm and good-humoured. At one point, First Officer Orgel said, There's a moon out there, or a spaceship. To which Captain Bushman replied, Yeah, the mothership. At 5 past 11, air traffic control broadcast a warning for severe thunderstorms around Little Rock Airport. Thunderstorms are no-go areas for aircraft. The combination of strong winds, extremely low temperatures, and heavy rain and hail have downed a number of aircraft over the years. The pilots pressed on towards Little Rock, getting increasingly concerned about the weather they would encounter in the coming minutes. At around half past 11, the pilots began their descent. When they contacted Little Rock Control Tower, the controller informed them that the thunderstorms were approaching the airport from the northwest, and that the winds at the airport were gusting as fast as 44 knots, or 50 miles an hour. First Officer Orgel, who was handing the radios, replied that he and the captain could see the lightning. The controller told the pilots to expect a landing on runway 22 left, which faces southwest. Because the winds were at an angle to this runway, the captain and the first officer began discussing the crosswind speed limitation for a landing. Airlines have rules about how strong a crosswind can be before pilots have to abort their approach, and Bushman and Orgel knew that they were probably close to those limits. Captain Bushman said that the crosswind limit was 30 knots, 
but then realised that this was the limit for dry runways, and that actually, the limit on wet runways was 20 knots. The first officer disagreed, he thought the limit was 25 knots. As it turned out, the captain was right. American Airlines' limit for landing the MD-80 on a wet runway was a 20 knot crosswind. This discussion was never fully settled however, and the winds were already gusting way beyond that limit. At 20 minutes to 12, the controller cleared the flight to descend to 3,000 feet. He then asked the flight crew about the weather on the final approach to runway 22 left, stating that the black and white weather radar he had in the tower was much worse than the colour-coded display the pilots had on board. First Officer Orgel responded that he could see the airport from where he was, and that the storm was further away than the controller thought. The controller offered the pilots a visual approach to the airport, meaning an approach where they could fly to the runway by sight. There were still intermittent clouds between the plane and the airport, however, and Orgel told the controller that he'd rather be directed to the runway via compass headings. The storm was really beginning to pick up at this point. The controller alerted the pilots that he'd received a wind shear warning for the airport. Wind shear is a dangerous phenomenon common in thunderstorms, where the wind rapidly changes direction over a short distance. It has caused planes to crash in the past, and is especially dangerous when aircraft are travelling low and slow, like on final approach. The pressure on the pilots was mounting. They were increasingly desperate to make it to the airport, but the conditions for a safe landing were looking less and less favourable. The controller then informed the crew that the wind had shifted, and was now blowing from the north. Captain Bushman decided that it would be safer to land into the wind, and requested vectors for an approach onto runway 4 right, which was the same runway, but in the opposite direction. The controller directed the pilots to fly heading southwest so that they could line up for this new approach. Soon afterwards, Orgel told the controller that he had the airport in sight, and the controller cleared the flight for a visual approach to runway 4 right. At a quarter past 12, the plane was flying parallel to the runway, with Captain Bushman resting to keep the aircraft on course in the fierce winds. First Officer Orgel pointed the runway out to Bushman on the right hand side, but the captain couldn't see it. The controller then cleared the flight to land, and Bushman said to the first officer, See, we're losing it. I don't think we can maintain visual. Argyll informed the control tower that a cloud had come between the airport and the plane, and that they would need radar vectors. The controller gave the pilots a heading of 220, roughly southwest, and instructed them to descend to 2,300 feet. The captain was becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the weather conditions. At one point he said to the first officer, I hate droning around visual at night in weather without having some clue where I am. Argyll responded, yeah, but the longer we go out here, and Bushman said, yeah, I know. Both pilots were now hyper-focused on making it to their destination. They appeared unwilling to consider diverting to one of their alternate airports. The wind was buffeting the plane from side to side, and as they flew through an intense downpour, Captain Bushman said, Oh, we're going right into this. At that same moment, the controller told the pilots that there was heavy rain at the airport, and that the visibility on the runway was less than 3,000 feet. Pressure was truly starting to build up at this point. The controller told the pilots that the wind was coming from 350 degrees, roughly north, at 30 knots, gusting to 45 knots, and First Officer Orgel read back this information incorrectly, saying that the winds were 030 degrees at 45 knots. Either way, the winds were far beyond the crosswind limitations, yet this either didn't occur to the pilots under their heavy workload, or it did, but they disregarded it. The captain instead focused on another part of the controller's weather report, saying, 3000 Orvior, we can't land on that. Four seconds later, perhaps after checking his charts, Orgel responded that the visibility limitation for landing on runway 4 right was 2,400 feet, not 3,000. The captain continued the approach. The crew seemed hell-bent on making it to the runway, despite numerous signs that they should abandon the approach. These signs would become even more glaring over the next few minutes. At last, the aircraft was lined up with the runway. The pilots lowered the landing gear and turned on the lights. At 11.48pm, the controller issued another wind shear alert, and again stated the winds on the runway. Still, the winds were well beyond the safe limits for landing, but the crew did not acknowledge this report, either to the controller or between themselves. Seconds later, the controller reported that the visibility on the runway had reduced to just 1600 feet. This was well below the 2400 feet that the pilots had minutes earlier discussed as being the minimum visibility, yet they ignored this as well. First Officer Orgel announced to air traffic control that the aircraft was established on the instrument landing system, meaning that they could fly the rest of the approach using their instruments. The controller repeated that the aircraft was cleared to land, and he again stated the winds and runway visibility, which still exceeded the safe minimums. Orgel acknowledged the landing clearance, and neither he nor Bushman considered abandoning the approach. In the turbulent conditions, and under increasingly self-imposed pressure to make it to the airport, cockpit discipline had entirely broken down. About two minutes from landing, First Officer Orgel asked the captain, 140 flaps? To which Bushman responded, Yeah, I thought I called it. The controller again reported the winds, which were still beyond the limits for a safe landing. And seconds later, Captain Bushman said, This is a can of worms. 
This statement alone should have told both pilots that it was time to go around, but they pressed on. Captain Bushman was now desperately fighting to keep the aircraft on course, using just his instruments. Finally, about one minute from touchdown, the runway came into view. Bushman called for the windscreen wipers to be turned on, and he proceeded to fly towards the runway visually. Things are about to happen quite fast now, so I'll put the rest of the cockpit voice recorder transcript at the bottom of the screen as I narrate the landing. The aircraft hit the runway hard and began sliding almost sideways. Bushman deployed the thrust reverses in an attempt to slow the aircraft down, but he used them at such a high power setting that they blocked off airflow to the rudder, making it harder to steer the aircraft. He used the rudder pedals vigorously, as well as the brakes and thrust reversers, alternating between left and right to slow the aircraft and keep it on the runway. But all of this was no good. The plane wasn't slowing down. 25 seconds after touchdown, and travelling at 180 km an hour, the aircraft slid off the runway. Seconds later, it slammed into the metal pier supporting the approach lighting system for runway 22 right. This pierced the cockpit and tore away the left side of the fuselage along the first class section, instantly killing Captain Bushman and two passengers. The plane then broke into three pieces and came to rest on the grass. As soon as the aircraft had come to a stop, a fire broke out in the rear section of the aircraft, where most of the passengers were located. This sent a wall of smoke through the fuselage, and while most passengers were able to evacuate through the overwing exits and the holes in the fuselage, four people were unable to get out in time and died due to smoke inhalation. In the cockpit, First Officer Orgel had survived the crash, but his leg was broken in three places, and he was pinned in place by debris. He used his mobile phone to call American Airlines Operations Centre to inform them of the crash, and then he called his wife, all before any rescuers had arrived on scene. It took firefighters almost 18 minutes to reach the plane, because the controller didn't initially specify which end of the runway the plane had crashed at. When they finally arrived, they found the passengers huddled in the rain near the flaming aircraft. They put out the fire in short order and rescued the remaining passengers from the aircraft, many of whom were badly injured. The first officer was the last person to be extracted from the plane, as it took an hour and a half to cut away the debris which had pinned him to his seat. He ultimately survived, along with most of the passengers. However, a total of 11 people died, nine of whom died in the crash itself, including Captain Bushman, while two more died later that week as a result of their injuries. You may have noticed during the crash sequence just there that I described a number of ways that the captain tried to slow the aircraft down. One way I didn't mention was the spoilers. These are flaps which pop up from the wing on touchdown. The spoilers are especially effective devices because they slow the plane in two separate ways. The first is literally by pushing against the air as it flows over the wing, in the same way that when you stick your hand outside the window of a moving car, you feel the air push it back. The second way that the spoilers slow the plane is that by directing the airflow upwards, they push the aircraft downwards onto the runway. This puts a lot more of the aircraft's weight onto the wheels, which makes the brakes a lot more effective. In fact, when the spoilers are deployed, about 80% of the aircraft's weight is supported by the landing gear, with the rest being supported by the wings. When the spoilers are not deployed on landing, and when the aircraft is 20 knots faster than usual, which was the case for American 1420, just 10% of the aircraft's weight is supported by the landing gear, while 90% is supported by the wings. In other words, as American 1420 skidded along the runway, it was effectively still flying. Its weight was being carried by the wings, and not by the wheels. Investigators quickly honed in on the lack of spoiler deployment as the key cause of the crash. Had the pilots remembered to either arm the spoilers on approach, or even deploy them manually after touchdown, they would have been able to stop the aircraft in time. This is a clear case of pilot error, but the more interesting question is why the pilots made such a basic mistake in the first place. This is why I went into such detail at the start of the episode about the pilots' accomplishments and experience. Bushman and Oracle were supposed to be outstanding pilots. Why did they mess up so badly? As investigators were trying to answer this question, they uncovered a disturbing practice throughout the airline industry. An MIT study conducted in 1999 found that when encountering heavy thunderstorms, which were within 25 kilometers of their destination, 9 out of 10 pilots chose to fly through them. This study found that crews were even more likely to fly through thunderstorms when other planes had flown through them already, or when the flight was running late. This means that it was common practice for crews to knowingly put passengers in danger when they thought it would save them some time. This phenomenon, whereby pilots are hell-bent on getting to their destination at any cost, is so well known in aviation that it has been given a name, get there itis And, as the crash of American Airlines Flight 1420 showed, even the best crews are not immune to this condition. On top of this, the pilots of Flight 1420 were fatigued. They had been awake for over 16 hours as they began their final approach, 
Rather than being asleep in their beds, which they would have been if the flight had departed on time, they were running behind schedule, switching runways at the last minute, struggling to keep the aircraft on course and complete checklists as they battled heavy winds and rain in a highly stressful and dynamic environment. It was almost inevitable that they would forget something in these frenetic few minutes. This fatigue, combined with their extreme workload, meant that on numerous times during the approach, the pilots failed to acknowledge that both the visibility and the winds were way outside the limits for a safe landing. They missed items on checklists, including, crucially, arming the spoilers, and they used non-standard terminology. The calm and measured atmosphere of the cockpit which had existed during the cruise phase had gradually disintegrated as the pilots neared the airport, and had become increasingly chaotic and disorganised on final approach. The cockpit voice recorder transcript painted a picture of the flight crew which would have been unrecognisable to anybody looking at their records on paper. Such is the effect of this particular combination of fatigue, delays, stress from high workload, thunderstorms, and a bad dose of get there itis. As a result of this crash, American Airlines revised its training on approaches and landings in poor weather conditions. Crucially, it also updated its flight operations manual to make it clear that a go-around must be performed if the approach is not stabilised by the time the aircraft is a thousand feet above the ground. The maximum duty time allowed for pilots has also been reduced, making errors due to fatigue less likely. The National Transportation Safety Board recommended that procedures be changed such that both pilots must verbally confirm on approach that the spoilers are armed, and again on landing that they have been deployed. They also recommended that air traffic control weather radar must meet a new minimum standard, and the controllers must give all known details about the location of a crashed aircraft to emergency services, without being asked. Since the crash of American Airlines Flight 1420, there has not been another fatal runway overrun in the US. In fact, this was also the last weather-related crash of an American airliner. If you found this video interesting, subscribe for weekly air accident videos. You can now support the channel and get early access to new videos by clicking the join button. Channel members also get a number of other cool perks, so take a look at what's on offer. As always, if you have any ideas for future episodes, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for watching.